So now you know what to expect. Let's do a quick run through just in case, because that was an incredible amount to take in. Just a quick run over of the basic infrastructure. So you have your domain controller, your file server for your shared data and profiles, a print server for your queues and the driver information to your clients, application servers, and their back-end databases. Now start with your license server for your Citrix farm. And good time to put on the terminal server license service and activate your TSCALs. In come your Citrix servers and they're going to be communicating with the data store, let's say in SQL on the back end. They also need to point to your license server and when they communicate between themselves using IMA they'll be exchanging load information that will be dynamically held in memory. I suggested we use a dedicated zone data collector, in other words no applications, it just performs the role of XML broker and it does that nice and quickly so that your user gets the best response time when they're querying their session. We drop the web interface on the same as the license server because they both have IIS. And out of these three servers, I nominated two to have the secure ticket authority. The communication was logging straight into the web interface, uh, then through to the XML broker, and the broker then does the authentication with AD. The user then clicks on the application they want, and a session is set up between the client and the most suitable server. Essentially we're down to a thin client device now because Citrix has taken over from where the desktops uh, were running the client software. And you're now using the Citrix servers to access your applications and probably load your profiles from the file server. If you want anything fancier with your applications, then the Citrix servers communicate with your application servers and they in turn contact the back-end databases. Print communication is dependent upon how you want to route that between the um, client and the Citrix server, so it could actually go from either device. You have certain control over that through Citrix policy. And internally, the mechanism, the mechanism is through the web interface to the XML broker, where that authenticates, and then it's the Citrix server that is the client and contacts the application and possibly the database in the back end. Now, for monitoring the resource monitor, the resource monitor? No. The... Um, Resource Manager, I knew it was close. You're going to nominate one of the servers as the primary farm metrics server. So that will collect all the metrics uh, from the day's activities to one Citrix server. That's become the, one of those metric servers becomes the database connection uh, server. And that periodically will then update the Resource Manager database. That's a different database. Uh, possibly on a daily basis. My recommendation is to use Edge Site. Okay, I don't work for Citrix. I just think this would be fantastic if I were back in support. Totally different and well worth setting up. I'm not going to go through it all here and obviously it has its own separate video. The Edge Site agents that are loaded on the Citrix server update the database and the user can generate reports by using the Edge Site web interface, uh, which is obviously interrogating the SQL backend. 
Now's the time we're going to go external. So we're going to use a DMZ and we need secure connections coming in from our outside workers. The first thing you'll probably do is relocate your web interface in DMZ. You can then drop the Citrix Secure Gateway software on it to provide that secure connection. If you just did this and kept the web interface in the DMZ, the client is going to have to go through the firewall rule. That's not the firewall uh, internally. Now that's not a biggie through the internal firewall, having another hole open. In this particular instance, uh, there is design error really. That license server is also in the DMZ, so you need to punch 27,000 hole for the Citrix servers. So the suggestion in this case, if you were architecting it, would be to relocate that onto a server back in the internal network. Now, often what I see is the introduction of a second web interface, not for redundancy, but just to handle the internal uh, communication and keeping the other web interface in the DMZ just for external. We can see how the authentication works internally, straight to the web interface, XML broker doing the authentication. I was being a little picky here, but we relocated the license server to the new internal web uh, interface, just because that's, that's a good move. Remember internally, the client has got a direct session open with the Citrix server once he's selected his application. Now, when we're external, um, so it's coming through the firewall, the Citrix, the XML broker is doing the authentication. Again, it's handed off to the least loaded server and that goes through the web interface in the DMZ. Remember that ICA traffic is encapsulated in SSL, so it's um, secure from prying eyes. Last thing, because it's the way things are going, we actually brought the web interface back into the internal network and we dropped a net scaler in the DMZ. This is the way it's going and although it looks like a physical um, device, it can be the net scaler VPX, a virtual appliance that you can configure. Actually it's not identically but it's very very close. Internally the communication stays as it was before. But now externally, I think we yeah we opened 443 and 80, which was going to be redirected by the Netscaler to 443. And this time authentication changes, so the XML broker doesn't do it, the gateway does it directly. There's a little bit more to it there. The Netscaler does actually have to pass it the credentials to the web interface because you still have to get the applications enumerated by the XML broker. So there is a little bit of toing and froing with the authentication details. Most importantly, if you're going to go external, there's a real case for dual factor authentication and I've just used RSA as an example. And again, the gateway is going to be responsible for doing that. I was going to say secondary authentication, but it's up to you which way around you want it. For instance, if you've got some of the new iPads, you're actually going to have to flick that round and make the RSA the primary authentication method. Um, redundancy, yes, yeah, so single points of failure. And you could do this anyway. Have a second terminal server license server. It doesn't have any licenses on, but if for some reason the main terminal server license server is down, it will issue a temporary TSCAL for, I think, 90 days. Next on the list would be a second web interface server. Now I know we've had two web interface servers in the design earlier, but this is for purely for redundancy. The Netscaler can handle that load balancing and not only does it handle it, it can monitor it so that it really does know which web interfaces are not only available but are functional. I did make a note there that you can get the Netscaler to authenticate to your AD in a load balanced way. 
And finally, we've got the highly available pair of net scalars. It's getting more and more common um, and relatively easy to uh, configure. So you do need to get your head around it. You obviously do need to play around with the forced fail failover. But uh, the fact that everything stays up um, as long as you, you're only monitoring that interface, I think that's the trick. So don't monitor the other interfaces uh, because when you force failover it will think um, anyway it gets confused they both monitor each other I won't go into that example anymore so where are we oh yes the web interface now generally the plugins come from the web interface that is the simplest method but you will only have the one opportunity you so it'll have to be the web interface software only so if you want to get anything fancier maybe the merchandising server is the correct method and of course it is going to be the way forward Citrix are going to promote that um, it is a virtual appliance that's something in its favor for sure um, I'm using it here in my Mickey Mouse uh, test area but it can deliver several um, plugins and if you change versions the delivery schedule is you're just changing it once are you and then every time somebody logs in you'll find the Citrix receiver does the installation and even if it doesn't work the first time the person reboots it'll force the installation the next so it's not bad it actually reduces the amount of service desk work if you have a lot of changes of plugins and yeah you do have to set up the merchandising service so that's able to authenticate and that's it. So again, I hope some of the things were clarified on that quick run through. And yeah, I gave you a few ideas, I hope.